I can remember queuing for a 20p styrofoam cup of coffee in the BBC canteen and Madonna was in the queue. I can remember, I remember when we had our first big hit, it was just that waiting for the midweek chart and then, oh, you're number one. Woohoo! You know, Elton John sent us a crate of vintage champagne. But we did have a stupid group dance in the middle, which was actually choreographed by Bruno Tonioli. No way. Virgin Radio 80s Plus. Reverend Richard Coles, hello. Welcome to Virgin Radio, Virgin Radio 80s Plus. Thank you. It is so good to have you here. Oh, it's very kind. Was it difficult coming up with these tracks? Because I know I said to you, just come in with a few. Yeah. But But it was difficult because, uh, partly because I wanted to track, um, I wanted to select tracks on merit. Yes. Also the ones that were significant to me personally, but also the ones that I was in the top of the pop studio when they did it. So that was, you know, because I've, I was involved in music in the 80s. So. And you gave me this memory just a moment ago when we were just starting up and you said, you do realise I was in the queue with Madonna buying a coffee I at think Top of the Pops? So. I think I can remember queuing for a 20p styrofoam cup of coffee in the BBC canteen and Madonna was in the queue. But I might have imagined it, I'm not sure. Well, I think we should go with it. That, okay, yeah, well, <laughs> that's that one, yeah. amazing. Yeah. You rhythmix Love is a Strange is your first song today. Yeah. Tell me why you picked this. Soundtrack to my arrival in London. I arrived in London in 1980, conveniently, for the show. And uh, the the record that I just associate with my first time in London was Love is a Stranger. All this excitement of being in London and the possibilities of that, romantic, and in terms of you know what I was going to do with my life, it was just that the soundtrack to that. And what was life like? Oh, it was brilliant. I mean, back I, at know, this time. Well, I was a gay runaway, Steve. So I grew up in in Kettering, and then I arrived in London, thinking, well, if there is a livable life, it's going to be here. And it was, and I had a wonderful time. And this was one of the records that I, I hear it and I'm back in that in that period. All of a sudden, life opened up, possibilities, hurrah. And your rhythmics were so good at writing songs, making memorable songs about the complexities of love. Yeah. Particularly good, weren't they, doing this? And, it, and you know, that was, I think, very significant for the 80s, because the 80s was a lot about love, erotic stuff, sexuality, all that stuff was beginning to kind of bubble up, and the rhythmics were, you know, got there. Dave and Annie were brilliant, you know, and they just got there before lots of other people did, and they did it in such a memorable way. I mean, they're just great, great songs. I'm going to ask you this loads uh, throughout the week, but did you, you must know them. You must have hung out with them. Well, but I know them. Annie a little bit, though I know Annie from, from later, because we're both now university chancellors in the way of 80s um, pop stars. So yeah. I know Annie, actually, we're having rather serious conversations about uh, the higher education sector. But, uh, yeah, I remember we did bump into each other because Annie was Scottish and Jimmy was Scottish, so they had an immediate kind of affinity for coming from the same place. I was a bit scared of Dave because I was rather in awe of him. Right. Why? Because he was so good at it and he just seemed so amazingly accomplished and everything he did turned to gold. And I was, in those days, I was shy and I was thought, oh my gosh, I'm a bit scared of him. Lovely. I've got a million questions to ask you, uh, Reverend. Richard, Can I call you Richard, Reverend? Richard, Can I call Richard, you Richard? Richard? I'd much I'd rather you do. That. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a million questions about this next track, Frankie, relax. There's so much to pick apart as far as this song's concerned. Why Why this one? Why have you picked this one? And what do you remember about it? If I was going to pick one song of the 1980s, I think it would be Relax. Partly because it's a great song. Partly because it's Trevor Horn, who is the most brilliant producer of that kind of music in that kind of time, I think. And partly also because... It caused this huge scandal. You remember the BBC, in a rather BBC sort of way, tried to ban it and instantly assured its kind of overwhelming success. But there's something about that big, chunky, chunky bass. There's something about Holly. There's something about the video, which all of a sudden stuff, which had never really had prime time exposure before, was there in front of us. And you thought, I don't know what this is about exactly, but I want some of it. Am I right in thinking, when this track came out, we were knee-deep in the the depression of the the AIDS situation, weren't we? It was kind of 84. I think it was a little before, actually, because it was a sexual licence was a thing, and the video was one that was kind of startling in its um, depiction of what some people were getting up to. And the only reason people were getting up to it was because they hadn't yet learnt that there were health consequences, because this awful virus had Mm -hmm. arrived about eight. I mean, it was here from about 82, but in most people's lives it impacted 
86, 87. I think. Right, OK. Because yeah. I remember my mum and dad looking at the video of this on top of the pops, and I, even me as a kid thought, this is racy. <laughs> well, so is... I love that idea, don't you? People sitting down to watch, I don't know, <laughs> Peters and Lee, and all of a sudden you get Frankie and their bondage gear. That's great. Even now, it looks edgy, though, doesn't it? Even now, when you look at the video. Yeah, I think it's edgy in a different way now. I mean, our values shift and change, don't they? And mm. it's still, it, it, it is an edgy song, and songs should be edgy. They should be the sounds that uh, speak to a, a new generation and express their hopes and their fears, I think. Do you remember where your life was at when this song came out? Oh, gosh, I was just hitting all the clubs in London in that time. I was finding my feet as a young gay man in London when that was really opening up. I was hanging out with Jimmy Somerville, who I'd met. In fact, I visited earlier today the place where I actually met Jimmy Somerville. Where was I, that? It was a, a bookshop called Gaze the Word in right. Marchmont Street. It was the first dedicated gay bookshop in London. And there was a coffee shop at the back, and that was where I met Jimmy in, I think, 1980, maybe 81. How amazing. Was that just a chance meet? Just happened to be there. We immediately got on, although I say immediately, I didn't understand what he was saying for about six months. <laughs> Very thick Glaswegian <laughs> accent. It took me a while to tune into it. But we've, you know, attraction of opposites. We just immediately had a an unusual rapport and... You know, that was to bear fruit later. Your next track on my 80s playlist is uh, The Smiths. The story, go- I read this story, the, the spelling of symmetry was uh, apparently, you know, because Morrissey couldn't spell. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it appeared. Is that true? Do you know about that? I don't know. I mean, we could forgive Morrissey his poor spelling, I think, because he was <laughs> such a brilliant artist of that. He was a great songwriter. And that magical combination of, of Morrissey and Mar as songwriters, but also Mike and Andy too. And it was very, very sad that Andy died recently. Yeah. Lovely, lovely guy. And I can remember being... I mean, I thought, you know, the 80s for me was about kind of synth pop, really. And then all of a sudden this guitar band came along, but they were doing all these exciting things with Morris's extraordinary brilliance with language, Johnny's superb playing, Andy's superb playing too. And uh, I just remember hearing this charming man for the first time and seeing the video and thinking... Oh, you can do it that way. It seems such a bold and original thing to do. I love they it. were so original, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah, and they were so good. They kept making brilliant record after brilliant record. And I just love this one. There's just something so something so kind of English about Morrissey, this, you know, kind of having a jolly old day wandering around the cemeteries, thinking about life, thinking about death in Manchester. There's yeah. something just so powerful about that. And did they, so they inspired you, did, did they? Well, not really, because I thought, I can't do what they're doing, but right. I'm really glad that they're doing it, you uh-huh. see what I mean? And of course, you know, they were much closer in their, they, you know, anticipated Oasis rather than reflected what we were doing at our sort of synth pop end. Well. But also, the, the great about the 80s was, you could get on top of the pops and you could have a band like the Smiths absolutely break through to mainstream audience in a way which I'm not sure how that would happen now, but everybody watched Top of the Pops. So yeah. you had this mad thing where you would have, I don't know, kind of Glenn Medeiros on, <laughs> followed by The Cure or something like that. So it was a very rich diet. And back then, obviously, bands could kind of work their way up to the top of the charts over weeks and weeks and weeks, couldn't they? Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it was an exciting mission, wasn't it? Yeah, and the record company campaign. I can remember, I remember when we had our first big hit it was just that waiting for the midweek chart and then oh you're number one Woo-hoo. you know elton john sent us a crate of vintage champagne did he he sent us a load of vintage a couple of cases i think i know we got a bit bored of drinking champagne but it was the 80s i want to talk to you about the communards you picked was this hard to pick one track well uh yeah in the sense that i think um don't leave me this way is probably the one the most enduring track we ever made um, but I really like this. It was another cover, Never Can Say Goodbye, from our second album, which yeah. we made with Stephen Haig. And I love it really because Jimmy's vocal, I think it's probably the best vocal he recorded. And he's an amazing, amazing singer. I'm still thrilled to hear it. And I remember recording it and saying to Jimmy, do you think you can do that? Do you think you can do that? He went, oh, yes, Joel. Yeah, no problem, Joel. Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking, are you sure you can do that? But he would just open his mouth and hit these extraordinary notes. How did you feel the first time you heard... Jimmy Somerville sing. I can never forget it. We were actually working on a video documentary for the newly formed Channel 4 back in 1982, I think it was. And we needed some music for that. And I was playing saxophone then. So I said, well, I'll play the saxophone. And Jimmy said, oh, I'll sing something. Jimmy's got a very deep, gruff he voice. He not he? You'd never guess that that voice would come, you no. know. No, and he opened his mouth. What came out was this extraordinary falsetto. And the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I think we all just thought, wow, this is amazing. 
And I remember going to the first ever Bronski Beat gig and looking around the, it was in heaven, and looking around heaven and just seeing other people thinking it too, including a guy from a record company. And All of a sudden, Bronski Beat happened. And watching the video, as I did just before you come in, of this song, you particularly, looked like you were having such a great time. It was a wretched, awful day. Jimmy and I were having one of the worst rows we ever had, and we had a lot. So I'm glad it looks like that, because it, it really wasn't like that off stage. But we did have a stupid group dance in the middle, which was actually choreographed by Bruno Tonioli. No way. He reminded me as he marked me ruthlessly down on Strictly and deservedly so. And it, of course, if I'd look rewatched that video, I perhaps would have hesitated before offering myself a Strictly Come Dancing because <laughs> it wasn't pretty. Do, do, let's talk about that quickly. Do you? Are, are you glad you did it? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. It, it looks so much fun. So much fun and so fascinating. And the best thing is, everyone who works on it is the best at what they do so you're great musicians great hair and makeup great camera operators Billy the guy who just stitches you up on the side of the stage if your pants burst you know well, they're just great <laughs> did that people. happen constantly <laughs> constantly listen uh, we're going to your song Communist please you introduce this go on Richard this is a cover version of Never Can Say Goodbye with a spectacular vocal by Jimmy Somerville produced by Stephen Haig it's been so great having you on at My 80s Playlist this week. Thank you so much. My it's been These songs have been great. We've come to Friday and Haircut 100. Come yeah. on, Richard, tell me about this. I just remember watching Haircut 100. It must be about 1981, I think. It was very early on. And thinking, oh, you look great. You look like you're having lots of fun. And I thought, that's just great. I want to be part of your gang. And I thought Nick Haywood was so charming and handsome and, and, and winning. And it was just a great little song about having fun and wearing shirts and boy meets girl and it was just I just loved it I thought it was and it, and it was so 80s that look I remember going to my barber and saying can I have hair like that he said what like, I said like like him like him off Haircut 100 he said no you can't not with your hair I said go on no, no it couldn't happen but the whole thing about it I thought this is new this is exciting this is fun I want to be part of it and how much fun looking back on it was the 80s and being in the charts at that time because people now look back on that and going that was a golden era that was a pivotal time well, I think it was I think for music it really was a very special time partly because we had you know record companies were still powerful and they were still record companies prepared to invest in bands and you know kind of allow a talent spot a talent believe in a talent support a talent I think it's much harder to do that now but also it was a very diverse and changing Britain Immigrant communities had come in, and that was just a very fertile relationship between people in the cities of Britain, I think. And lots of people just doing imaginative bold things in their back bedroom with a guitar and a stylophone or something. Yeah. So it, 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 was, it was a good time to be there. And it's a good time to be in a band, you know? Yeah, amazing stuff. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, this week. I know that you're a writer, a broadcaster, an Anglican priest. You've written books. Your current book, uh, which I've just finished reading, is fantastic. Can you just tell us where we can get it and what it's called? It's called A Death in the Parish, and it's the next one in the Canon Clement Mystery Series. It's about set in the late 1980s, funny enough, in a little village in England, and it all looks very settled, and all of a sudden a murder comes along, and this vicar detective of mine has to figure out Who's done it, why, and how to fix it? Noisy neighbours, difficult mothers, spirited dogs. That's it. I loved it. Richard, thank you so much. Lovely to meet you. My pleasure.